Richard. Thanksgiving, a time of good tidings, turkey, and tryptophan. Some of the great traditions of the holiday are cherished, like sitting in your living room in a near comatose state watching football. As you doze off watching Detroit get destroyed in perennial fashion, you can ask yourself, how can I benefit from this? With DraftKings, the sponsor of this video, you can. All new customers can bet $1 on any of the three games that day and receive $100 in free bets. Easier said than done if you're Detroit, but they've done it before. As long as the game doesn't end in a 0-0 tie, you get $100 in free bets. DraftKings is safe, reliable, and secure. And you can deposit and withdraw your money at any time. Thanksgiving football is a pastime unlike any other. And with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL, it can make it even more special. Download the DraftKings app now and use promo code UTREE when you sign up to receive $100 in free bets if you bet $1 on any team to win. And remember, this is only with DraftKings. Now I wish you all a happy Thanksgiving if you're in the States. And enjoy the video. Have you ever seen those nature documentaries where a cheetah or a leopard toys with its prey before they make it their final meal? A sick pleasure in torturing the poor bastard pissing itself. I should put on a really shitty Richard Attenborough impression for this segment. It's about as much of an effort as the Falcon offense made. I cannot exaggerate how dominant the Patriots were. Atlanta didn't just get shut out, they couldn't get over 100 yards of total offense until the end of the third quarter. Don't be mistaken, this was not a repeat of 28-3. That would imply the Falcons put up any sort of fight. For the second time in five days, Matt Ryan is left to die, players seemingly give up and their opponents look like contenders. Although the Patriots have looked really damn good as of late. If their offense wasn't carrying around Josh McDaniels to relevance, the game would have been uglier. Dread it. Run from it. The destiny of New England arrives all the same. The hoodie is inevitable. San Francisco is one of the few teams that gets to experience roughly two bye weeks in the season. No, this isn't a 20-week schedule. When you play the Jags, it's the equivalent of lining up against the scout team. These are games meant for teams like the Niners where they've had both the win column and their confidence in situational football. Sometimes I think Urban Meyer's game planning involves a daiquiri on the beach and a night in a bar in Columbus. With how sloppy Jacksonville was today, it reinforces that thinking. The differences between the two franchises were night and day. It was very bullish on San Fran at the start of the year. And perhaps they're finally tapping into that potential of theirs with Kittle returning. They'll need it too. The rest of their schedule is a nice little grab bag of goodies to pick from. Howie Roseman, waking up to take his 2 a.m. shit, stretches with conviction and gracefully slouches towards the penthouse bathroom. Stumbling over several hookers and a few circus animals, he groans and looks at his reflection in the mirror. What he sees? Excellence. He's been a busy boy. Dallas Goddard and Avante Maddox were delivered nice extensions before the game against New Orleans. And capitalizing on their weakness was a piece of cake. The Saints are without a significant chunk of their offense to injury, no one cares. What really matters is the false hope consuming the city of Philadelphia Hall. It was a convincing win with relentless defense and a blistering rushing attack. Are the Eagles any good? Not really, but look at it this way. The opportunity to strike is there for them. Their next five opponents are the Giants twice, the Reskins twice, and the Jets. Howie Roseman and the Eagles are licking their chops. This is their chance to assert themselves to get their asses kicked in the first round. I look forward to them pissing off a fanbase or two in January. Leave it to my goddamn jinx for me to say that I had criticisms about the Colts. The week after I say they haven't beaten a legitimate opponent this season, Indy goes off and teabags an AFC contender like it's Halo 2. You gotta celebrate a killing spree like theirs in style, I don't blame them for it. The Colts saw Buffalo's insanely one-dimensional offense and pounced. Josh Allen, the alpha and omega of their offense, could do nothing. The running game that does little besides Josh Allen did even less than that. The Bills will lick the boot as it presses on their face. And the one squeezing the life out of them is a man named Jonathan Taylor. How dominant was he today? Five touchdowns. Bills Mafia turned into an army of try-hard 12-year-olds on Call of Duty after watching this onslaught. Indianapolis may be inconsistent and I still have questions about them, but they have momentum. With dominant performances like this under the belt, that could make them very dangerous moving forward. Detroit plays hard for their coach, but that's only one component to a winning team. 
There's also this pesky thing they need called players that can play at the professional level. Jared Goff has been terrible, but he's injured. Lions fans meet Tim Boyle. He's been marinating under the tutelage of Aaron Rodgers for the past few seasons. After his performance in Cleveland, he needs to get back in the football oven. He still needs to cook. Preferably for another 20 years. It wasn't like the Browns were even good. Baker Mayfield is visibly injured and he's turning into a liability with how it's injuring his performance. The Browns are out of sync, yet they're insanely lucky that they managed to face the worst team in football and come out of it alive. Hell, they can even one up the Steelers by saying they didn't tie them. Dan Campbell's taken over play calling recently. And it's obvious he doesn't trust them to do anything as he's more conservative than a man stashing cash under his bed after the depression. The best part about this game was that it ended. May we never speak of this evil again. Jets know that tank bowls need to be special occasions. The fans may want to see if Mike White can bounce back after a terrible game, but there is no need. This event needs a master of ceremonies. And that man's name is Joe Flacco. Who cares about figuring out what we need for the future? New York needs to win football games, the executives will cry. But I know why you started the master of the checkdown. It's for that wonderful tank. Miami doesn't have their pick this year and you wanted to do them a solid? That's relatively noble of you thinking long-range game by losing to the Dolphins in a game that just... existed. Besides a really solid performance from Tua, there was nothing all that notable about it. Ask anyone on the streets of New York about this match and you'll just get puzzled looks on their faces. It was a contest that was only played to fulfill TV contract obligations. Maybe for Miami to believe they have a chance of sneaking into the playoffs? Possibly? Certainly nothing that the Jets will want to remember. Allow me to defend the Tennessee Titans with this brief disclaimer. The Titans are heavily injured on both sides of the ball. They're about to break the record for most players used in an NFL season, and it's only halfway through the year. Weather and field conditions were atrocious throughout the majority of the game. Tennessee has been playing excellent football against all odds this season while dancing through the raindrops. With these considerations in mind, all I can say is this. <laughs> you lost to the Texans! <laughs> <laughs> what the hell even was that? This wasn't just misery, this was a form of torture erotica. Ryan Tannehill was so awful that Adam Gase is whipping out his Sam Darnold flashlight. Tyrod Taylor turned into Lamar Jackson for a game and led Houston to a shred of a positive outcome. Everything's coming up Easterby, now tie 10% of your earnings to make sure he can fill his pockets. I know any given Sunday and all of that, but this is laughable. This is the number one seed in the AFC? How pathetic is this conference? Life is returning to normal for Panthers fans. Super Cam has come home. It felt weird seeing him in a Patriots uniform. It's a chance to correct a past mistake. And he's rejuvenated not only a city, but perhaps an entire league. This also signals Riverboat Ron's return to Carolina after being fired, but no one gives a shit about that. This day is about Cam Newton and Cam Newton alone. Yes, the game may be neck and neck, but the Panthers are playing competitive. And they're doing everything they can against Washington. Unfortunately, the problem for them was in another former Carolina Panther, Taylor Heineke. He balled out in what could be considered his grudge game. He had played them in 2020, but he was a substitute in garbage time. Now he's playing out of his goddamn mind. He's led the redacted to a three-point lead. And the defense will do the rest. Be baffled at the Panthers going for it on fourth down at their own 30, but it was an outstanding play to keep McCaffrey away from the chains. It's enough for Washington to play spoiler. Cam Newton's glorious return is a piss parade. The football team survives an onslaught as Riverboat Ron gets the last laugh. Not that it's gonna get any easier, but the NFC is really wide open. The Ravens have had a very tough season. Injuries have ravaged their lineup, but they found a way to persevere despite underlying warnings. Lamar has flaws, but he's been the catalyst for this winning. They're gonna need a new hero this week. He's out against Chicago due to illness. I know what you're thinking, but it's not one of those things you just shit out after a few days. But don't worry, Baltimore. They have a new product they've released on the shelves just for this situation. I can't believe it's not Lamar Jackson, also known as Tyler Huntley. He may be imitating Lamar, but Matt Nagy is imitating an NFL head coach. The result is slop that pigs would turn their head at. Somehow, Justin Fields is even worse than Huntley is. At least Huntley's got the excuse of coming in at the last minute for an L starter. 
What's Chicago's alibi? They're without key players on defense, but defense isn't the issue. You had a fucking bye week to prepare, why are you having so much trouble against this shit? Even worse, they managed to kill off Fields after letting him take a beating. Great going, lads. Now for Andy Dalton to throw a random touchdown off the bat to bring Chicago to the pits of despair. Despair, you say? Why is that? It's because every win means nothing changes for the Bears. With how rough Baltimore has been on offense, even with Justin Tucker taking the lead, nothing is precious. Well into the fourth, the Ravens are about to finish off a pretty win as Chicago tries their worst to pull off the unthinkable. All Baltimore needs is a stop on fourth and 11. Dalton from the pocket. Way up, he's coming! Makes a catch! And that bears! All that effort just to blow a tire on that coverage? Good job, Chicago's now up by four. They'll need Huntley to open up, I can't believe they committed pass interference on a terrible throw. They'll need to purchase, I can't believe the Bears defense is folding. And I can't believe Sammy Watkins got something besides an injury. And a little something extra at the register. Why is Matt Nagy still coaching the Bears? Don't give me injuries, Baltimore is practically dead and somehow got extremely lucky by playing you. The rest of the AFC North is glaring at Chicago. They pissed themselves. Big time. You blew it, boy! You really blew it! Minnesota continues their yearly quest to frustrate every single person who pays attention to them whatsoever. Last week, they played a quality game. Probably the best one they've played all season. Against their big brother to the east, they'll need a lot more of it. Getting out to an early two-score lead is a good start, but then again, this is Green Bay. Older brother always knows his sibling's weakness. The Achilles heel here is Aaron Rodgers in the blistering passing attack. Thus, an offensive duel begins. A contest of sibling superiority. Minnesota strikes with fury. The Packers respond by making me hate the Vikings with every fiber of my body. They may have lost the lead, but can they avoid the typical pratfalls? So far, that answer seems to be yes. Kirk Cousins reminds us all why Minnesota gave him that massive contract to begin with. He drives the wagons down the field for another touchdown and two-point conversion. But you have to remember, these are the Vikings. Floats one, Valdez, Scantling in stride, trying to get to the end zone, he's gonna go! Nothing ever comes easy. To win, they'll have to do the impossible, not fuck up. Cousins nearly throws a back-breaking pick, but the gods appear to be in your favor today. The pass was ruled to hit the ground, thank God. Well, Sol Douglas nearly picked off another bad throw as well, but he whipped like a brewer at the plate. I don't know how, but the Vikings did it. An efficient drive that not only gets them in field goal range, but gives Aaron Rodgers no time for a response. Do me one favor, please don't fuck up the kick, boys. He's got it! Winning consecutive quality games, huh? About time you start playing up to your abilities. With this win, despite the rocky start to their season, the Vikings all but control their own destiny. Let's hope the usual doesn't happen with them. Annual Raider free fall continues. Unfortunately for them, Cincinnati needed this game coming off a bye and an ugly loss to Cleveland. The final score is deceiving. Things were tighter than me in skinny jeans for three quarters. Neither team was willing to concede ground, and for good reason. This was must win for both sides. However, in the end, the straw that broke the Raiders' back was in the usual suspects. The defense couldn't make a critical stop if their lives depended on it. Cool Joe Burrow skied the ball to his weapons, creating that sweet magic throughout the fourth quarter. Derek Carr only did the standard throw a big pick trying to come back from multiple scores. Since he responds to said pick with more points, Carr proceeds to drive the team off a cliff. Game over. Raiders lose their third in a row. However, and more importantly, the Bengals have their much needed bounce back game. It's just the beginning for them though. They'll want to make another statement against Pittsburgh next week. If there was an unofficial end to a season for a team, the Seattle Seahawks just had it happen. Arizona is on the road hobbled once again. They are without Kyler and DeAndre for a third straight game. Despite this fortuitous advantage, Seattle just can't do anything. It was a frustrating endeavor for anyone in attendance. The problem for them wasn't the defense getting gashed, they tried to hold their own. It was in their offense. Word of advice, boys. Try disconnecting and reconnecting the router. You're so goddamn out of sync that it's holding up the entire enterprise. Pure lag to the point where the Seahawks don't even notice that the Cardinals are having a tough time putting field goals in between the uprights. Despite everything they've done to sabotage themselves, Seattle is only down by three in the fourth. All they have to do is make one stop. Just one goddamn stop. 
please, for the poor bastards in attendance, make a fucking stand! The only thing holding is Jamal Adams near the goal line. Death by an ironically dull and lifeless dagger. Arizona wins a game Seattle needed badly. Dreams of playoffs fade faster than DK Metcalf after flipping out on Shannon Sharp on Twitter. Can you guys do me one favor, though? If the fans are gonna jump off the ledge, at least do it in 12s. This was a crucial test for Kansas City. They had a great game last week, but that's only one matchup against an opponent prone to midseason prolapses. Now Dallas, though, they're a legitimate challenge. They may be without Amari Cooper due to COVID, but you can't take them lightly. The Cowboys can dice a suspect defense up 20 times before the end of the second quarter. But this year is different. The NFL tells us all to fuck our narratives. Dallas is being frustrated by the Chiefs' defense. The mighty star can do nothing against them. Some of it is due to situations of Dallas laying an egg in the middle of Arrowhead, but the defensive line dominated in the trenches all game long. It wasn't pretty to see. The Chiefs' offense was quite inconsistent, as it usually has been this season. But what they did was enough to take down a strong contender. I'm more surprised that the Cowboy offense was dispatched by Kansas City of all teams. Maybe Dallas was just that inept defensively again. For the second time in three weeks. What the hell? Dallas's random flat tire against Kansas City isn't the only thing leaving us at a loss for words. It's also the NFL's relentless crusade against taunting. They've tripled down on their stances. Taunting is a point of emphasis, state propaganda says. Those who deny the rulings of the Football Politburo will be sent to Gulag. The children are watching and players need to be role models for them. Clyde Edwards Hilaire will be sentenced to death next Tuesday. He pointed at a defender as he ran in for a touchdown. This post traumatized many younglings watching at home. Six-year-old John Mara was so distraught he beat up trash cans in his home. The years of therapy these children need for this despicable act is incalculable. A league that employs domestic abusers, criminals, and alleged rapists is telling us they suddenly care about the children. That's hysterical. NFL making you lol cow of the week is a point of emphasis this season. Now stay tuned for more alcohol and sportsbook commercials because we give a shit about the children. Nothing warms my yins or heart more than watching Steelers fans flood into the Chargers home stadium and waving those terrible towels. Sadly for those poor bastards, there isn't much to cheer about in this game. The Black and Gold Brigade is without nearly all of their defensive playmakers. And they're being picked apart by LA in this glamorous terrain. The Steelers have no answers for Justin Herbert. None. The offense couldn't afford to make mistakes either, but a terrible call on a fourth and goal might have truly sealed their fate. It's another route headed into the fourth quarter as Pittsburgh has a 17-point deficit. Just get it over with, Chargers. Put this team out of its misery and we can all go to bed. That's exactly what the Steelers needed. Perhaps someday the Chargers can figure out this thing called special teams. Maybe they can stop shooting themselves in the cock with bad penalties at the goal line. But LA is still rolling along, and absolutely no one can stop Justin Herbert on the run besides Cam Hayward, a little too aggressively. Pittsburgh is still down by 14 and struggling to keep Ben upright. But thankfully on a third and five, they do get some of that glorious high-end talent by means of Deontay Johnson. The Charger defense is starting to break down, which is great, but they're still down by one score late. The Steelers are gonna need a 10th miracle to go their way. Look out. Oh my god, it's happening. I thought it was being hyperbolic, but in fact it was the holiest of gospels. The Pittsburgh Steelers are going to the Super Bowl. Do you see what is happening right now? The Chargers are bringing their San Diego ways to the rampant Steelers fans in attendance. I don't know how the fuck they're tied, but I'm not gonna complain. We're not the Cleveland Browns, LA. You can't go for it on fourth down at your 30 and expect to survive. The Steeler offense doesn't have to do much, but it's enough. Pittsburgh has the lead. False hope is becoming reality. Look out, NFL! Nobody's stopping these fuckers now! Are you fucking shitting me? You make that furious and unprecedented comeback only to lay an egg on defense? Fuck. I don't know how the hell that was a game. The Steelers should have lost by at least two scores, but the gods demanded anarchy. The Chargers nearly snagged defeat from the jaws of victory, but it doesn't matter. The Steelers are still going to the Super Bowl. This match proved it. 
Wherever he goes around New York City and MetLife Stadium, John Mara should be relentlessly taunted for how useless he is as a human being. The only strength he has is coasting on Granddaddy's reputation. His Giants are an extension of his futility. Tampa Bay is their opponent in name only. Saying that word would mean that the Bucks experienced any sort of challenge. The New York Giants are the tutorial level. They are there to help you build your confidence in the control scheme and hand you opportunities to succeed. It should be a surprise to no one that Tampa Bay manhandled a team that endlessly derped themselves to death. The Buccaneers had their token terrible loss for the season the week before, and it's usually their trend to kick their next opponent's ass. And guess who that was? At this point, I'm expecting Mara to pull what AB's former chef did and accuse people of faking their vax cards. It would make sense since he's not one to look in the mirror. Football is a brutal game. May the bell toll for the fallen. <coughs> 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 Unit lost. Unit lost. <coughs> Unit lost. <coughs> Unit lost. Unit lost. <coughs> Unit lost. Unit lost. <coughs> Unit lost. <coughs> Thus concludes another week of this sermon on the field. Amen.